There are no pubs where I'm going now. By rights, there shouldn't be any houses or roads either. But we don't have much land that comes close to being wilderness in Britain. And what we do have is compromised by ski lifts, organised hunting, pest control, forestry, even by its own history. The idea of wild places working out their own destiny has never found much favour here. And we seem to feel more at home in our snug and tidy domestic countryside. Yet if we value nature at all, shouldn't we also make some room for naturalness? Wouldn't it be good for us to have a few places that challenge our assumption that we always know best? They might just help us understand more about our place in the natural scheme of things. The idea of wilderness as a retreat from the claustrophobia of cities developed quite late in Britain. Until well into the 19th century, cities were regarded as the pinnacles of order and civilization. Wild and mountainous areas were seen as places of desolation and chaos and of untamed, unredeemed creatures that still carried the mark of the beast. But the Industrial Revolution changed all that. Polluted air and overcrowding drove increasing numbers of people to look for replenishment in the undeveloped countryside. And the railways, ironically, gave them the chance to seek it in ever wilder places. At the end of the line was the Cairngorms, the last British frontier. You could have many different visions of wilderness here, with a spectacle of big animals roaming free, in ancient rockscapes, in a sheer sense of space and limitlessness. The wilderness, the first encountered in 1938. I was a townie, and what a tremendous experience it was to find the difference that there could be between the city square and the middle of the Larry Groove. I was in touch for the first time in my life with wilderness land, and I instantly fell in love with it. I realized that this was my scene. And I used to get a kind of a feeling as a boy of 17 with one or other of my pals. Feeling in the pit of the stomach, an emotional feeling. And even to this day, just occasionally, I'll get a feeling which takes me right back to that original hill experience. I first went to the Cairngorms with my parents when I was um, probably about five or six years old. Uh, I didn't regard it as wilderness, that was a concept I, I learned later on as a scientist. I just found it a fascinating place. I went on my own as soon as I could, and that was when I was about 13 years old. The first time I saw a ptarmigan was the first time I'd been onto the higher ground. So it was this incredible excitement. And I remember getting near the top of the hill and uh, suddenly seeing this, uh, what I thought was a stone moving. And this was uh, a cock ptarmigan on a rock, beautifully camouflaged. And beside him was a hen, slightly browner. And he let me get up very, very close. I thought, oh my goodness, that's the most beautiful bird I've ever seen. It was almost a spirit of the Cairngorms, because it lives there all year round. Some of the other birds just come for the summer. I think undoubtedly the Cairngorms are uh, the best and largest piece of wilderness in Britain. You've got a very high area of Arctic-like terrain here where you can get snow even in June, July and August. And in conditions like this, when you've got a bit of fog as well, 
It's very featureless country. You've got to know your way around and know how to navigate because sometimes if it gets thicker than this, you can't even see your feet. My first introduction into the Highlands was from a bike and I passed through this country and I just looked at it and I saw the mountains, I saw the lochs and the high quarries with snow still in them and I just could not believe my eyes that such a place existed in Scotland. And I remember very well the first time and seeing an eagle. The eagle's wingspan was so massive and it was flying so easily, soaring high in the sky. And as I watched, the eagle began to plummet. As she came nearer and nearer, the huge wings just opened and the tail fanned out. And she just launched gently onto the eyrie. That was a creature that was to stay with me right on into my working life. But Dick Harry's ideas about wilderness have changed since he became professionally involved with the Highlands. The wilderness I talk about is the wild land. The land that really never gave people a living. The tops of our mountains, those areas of where people never actually built their homes and lived a life, if you like. Whereas the glens, that's where people lived and that's where we need people living. You're in a place called Glen Erkig, where I was born and bred. My people came from this Glen and this area. And of course it means a great deal to me because of that. Remote and self-sufficient communities like this have always clustered around the margins of the wilderness. There has been a lot of changes. The biggest change in all, of course, is that there are not so many people as even when I was young, this glen was highly populated with people uh, that were working on estates and to do with, mostly to do with deer and the rest of the population would be crofters who relied a little on estates, estates as well because they got uh, part-time work there in the summertime. But perhaps an even greater change has been in the lifestyle of the human settlements. The old crofting communities live much like the other creatures of the wilderness edge, grazing and raising families in the glens and hunter-gathering in the wild uplands. Life here, even in the glens, is a constant battle against distance and loneliness. Postal service to the distant parts of Glen Erskig was absolutely fantastic in those days. Uh, postmen had sometimes had to walk four miles to a lonely keeper's house and he did it three times a week, which is actually a better service than we get nowadays. In those lonely houses, uh, where there was a gamekeeper, say, five or six miles beyond this glen, and there was children, the education department supplied them with a, what was called then a side school teacher. Well, I have very fond memories of this glen. I came, was working here when I was about 17 years old. I went to teach a gamekeeper's family up at the far end of uh, the glen here and 21 miles from there up into Park Forest. I wanted to see what these very isolated places were, were like. And they did live differently. I was homesick, I must admit for the first few days, but then I settled in with the family and I was quite happy. I had my daily work to do, and when the school hours were over, 
you shared uh, very much in the household work. You gave Mrs. Mackay a hand. If the men were cutting peats, you went and gave them a hand too. You did all these jobs that were around the place. I think they had a very lovely way of life up there. They, they worked very close to nature and seemed to be contented and they never seemed to want. Oh yes, I, I happened to get blown up in the war. Got blinded, hand damaged, lost a, lost a leg. I was in the 92nd British General Hospital, Naples. And a fellow patient of mine said, here there's a Scots lassie in a neighboring ward. She belongs to the ATS or something, and she's had her appendix out. The Scots lassie came along, looked in, and what she saw was a mountain of bandages. This was me, she said, who is the Scotsman in here? I said, me. So she had a chat. And in two minutes we were talking about Ben McDewey and Kieran Gorham and the Larry Grew because she knew them as well as I did. I didn't see May McFarlane, as she was called, for another 20 years. She came and visited me. And she said, you know, you said something, Sydney, in that hospital all those years ago, which I've never forgotten. You said, I can do without my sight, but I can't do without my mountains. Well, the problem has resolved itself over the years because I never got back my sight, but I was very, very much to become involved with mountains again. And I discovered, having got back to the hills blind, there wasn't any difference. The wilderness experience was not an, or, an oral one or a, or a visual one. It was an inner one. It was something that happened inside. Wordsworth, one of the first literary enthusiasts for the wilderness, also saw it as an experience, a condition of the spirit as much as of the land. And this may be the only honest way to look at it in Britain. Even Cairngorm would be ruled out if we took the strict definition of wilderness as land untouched by human hands. In these hills, we've waged war on the big predators and destroyed the natural forests. There are pesticides in the snow and shotgun lead in the soil. Yet though it may only be a partial wilderness, it has a palpable wild aura. And it's appreciated in a unique way by every kind of visitor. For Rannoch Moor, on which we situated on, is the biggest moor in Britain. It's the most densely populated deer country in the whole of Scotland. On this 81 square miles live only eight people. It's so wild and remote that there's places which are so boggy that you can't even get to, but they support a great deal of wildlife because of the wetness and the wildness and the wilderness. I grew up in Yorkshire and I worked in industry, in terrible jobs in factories. I used to yearn for the wilderness so that at weekends I could go off. During the time I worked in these factories, I was married. And my wife and I had an agreement that when our two children were self-sufficient, might not be a bad idea uh, if I were to go and live in the wilderness permanently. 
and that was what happened. And we parted the best of friends 23 Come years on, ago. And I took a long stroll up the uh, Pennine Way. Come on, the hill. And eventually finished up here at Lacossian, where I've been ever since. My work here involves looking after the hostel, which concentrates on giving cheap accommodation for young people. The hostel was once a staging post for another group of leisure-seeking incomers, who had a profound impact on the landscape and ecology of the Cairngorms. Deer stalkers from England and the continent began arriving for shooting holidays in the mid-19th century. They came by train and luxury steam launch, and lived in very different conditions from the crofters. They demanded more deer to shoot too, and herd numbers were pushed up inexorably. But stalking did at least provide alternative employment for the displaced crofters. The deer were very important to glens like this because of all their work that was created because of them. There was quite a lot of people employed as stalkers and gamekeepers and gillies and also uh, in the summertime the hunting lodges would be full of guests and they would have lots of estate workers. These uh, landlords would bring some of their own staff and they were usually youngish girls who would be maids. If there was any dances in the area, these young girls would be going to the dances. I remember one year, two of these young girls got married to two of the young natives. That made life a little bit more interesting and took fresh blood into the place and caused lots of happiness in, in, on various occasions when things like that would happen, you know. I remember stalking over on that mountain once. My oldest son was actually being born in hospital in Inverness. I went out stalking anyway. I actually shot a royal stag. It was early in the year and perhaps it wasn't, uh, the head wasn't fully formed, but it was a royal. The deer can smell you for miles, so that you've got to come in against the wind to wherever they are. Also, they generally have a sentry with them. When you do see them, you have to choose every little bit of cover. down and I found out he was born, I discovered when, when he was born and I, it coincided with the time I shot the stag. I love the deer, I don't want them destroyed for destruction's sake. Uh, they're too beautiful an animal just to kill them for the pleasure of killing them. But they have to be culled and that sort of thing. When I first came to Cairngorms in 1943, there were lots of deer, but the numbers have increased greatly since then. They were already so high in the 40s and 50s that no young trees were managing to uh, regenerate naturally. The natural vegetation of Cairngorm is what has become known as the Old Caledonian Forest an open, mixed-age, self-seeding woodland of native Scots pine. Most of this was destroyed by logging, and then by sheep and deer, 
which browsed away any new saplings. And more recently, very different tree lands, dark plantations of exotic conifers, have spread like a pool where the old forest grew. The yearning to live close to nature can destroy it. You need rose to get there, for instance. A lone skier can be just another wilderness creature. But what about whole flocks of them, ten months of the year? Before the, the ski lift began, skiers, including me, came here in the 40s and 50s to ski here because it was one of the best snow lie areas in Scotland. There's now a, a major um, ski area here, Cairngorm. It uh, has the largest number of skiers of any of the Scottish ski areas. I can remember this place um, coming to Cairngorm when I was 13 years old. And uh, there was a pothole dirt road from Coilham Bridge to Glenmore. And there was no road beyond that. There was a path up to Cairngorm, uh, but uh, no road. As the business built up, they built extra toes on different parts of the hill. And uh, what you've got is a chairlift which operates at all seasons and takes walkers up in the summertime, and also tourists that don't want to walk far, just want to go up for the view. Crows and gulls have been attracted to the ski area by food scraps dropped by people. And the ptarmigan are very vulnerable to predation because they, they nest in the open. And so on Cairngorm itself, most of the ptarmigan nests now get robbed by crows. And so the birds' numbers have declined. Even in these vast empty spaces, we refuse to let go of the reins. The Golden Eagle should be in control here. Each pair patrols something like 25 square miles of territory, and they are the pure essence of Cairngorm wilderness. But like wolves driven into extinction 300 years ago, they've been anciently persecuted. There are still some sheep farmers who believe, against all the evidence, that eagles regularly take live lambs and household pets, as well as rabbits and hares. Between 1979 and 1989, there were 40 proven cases of eagles being deliberately killed in Scotland. And from the 1960s, they faced an insidious new threat. One of the first tasks that was I occupied in was to look at the problems relating to golden eagles. Young eagles were dying in the nest. Why? Climbing into the eagle's eyry and, you know, invading its privacy is always one that you sort of do with the sort of utmost of care because the golden eagle, for me, is the wildest of all creatures. It will never return to the eyry if anyone is near or even within half a mile of it. So when you climb into the eyry, the purpose was to do your work, to weigh the young bird, to do it all and do it quickly and get out again. But of course you had to do it safely, and very often eagles nest in places which are really quite difficult to get in and out of. My rope climbing te technical skills were not that great, so therefore my heart was often in my mouth as I got in there as fast as I could and out again to let the eagle back in again in order to feed its chick. In his research in the 1960s on 50 pairs of golden eagle on the northwest coast of Scotland, Dick Balharry found that of those that fed chiefly on sheep carrion, 90% failed to breed successfully. Now, of course, the big real interest in this is not so much as the fact that the golden eagles were dying, it was why were they dying? And they were dying because of sheep dip, dip that was going on to sheep twice annually into the body fats of the sheep where they were being stored. 
And as the sheep died and golden eagles feed 60% on carrion, then the eagle digested the poisons but couldn't get rid of them. We realized that it was two poisons, Dildon and Aldrin, that was the cause of this problem. Now the real interest here is, of course, is that we, humans, eat far more mutton than golden eagles eat. And that was one of the big things that came out of that particular research, that Dildon and Aldrin were banned from about 1968 for this purpose. Adult eagles can live to good ages and were able to ride out the time when pesticides made them sterile. Now there is the chance for them to spread beyond their old territories. In my work searching for golden eagles, I've seen many martens, and particularly at the den. In the early 1960s, pine martens were very rare. It was even thought they might be even extinct. And it was more and more a challenge for me to see this animal, to take pictures of it, and to find out how it ticks. And one day, I was climbing a mountain and I saw this animal up in a tree. And I thought, that's funny, a big furry animal, about the size of a small cat, brown and a beautiful neck, sort of a yellow apricot neck, lovely, lovely gold-trimmed ears and whiskers, beautiful animals they are. And I saw this beast and I thought, ah, this is the pine martin, lovely. And I remember climbing down, and sure enough, this was a female, and she'd young in a crevice. And she actually pounced on my shirt, and had a khaki shirt on her, and these very sharp claws, because her claws are very sharp, non-retractable, unlike a cat can sheep them. The pine martins are out all the time for climbing. And she just jumped in my arm and sprung away again. And that was enough for me, that was the warning. And I thought, no, I'm getting out of here. And I left her to it. Pine martens and eagles are probably the two creatures I love the most. The most moving experience in that situation of sitting there watching this great bird was when it brought in a pine martin. It was a young one, brought it in, still warm, and started feeding it to its chick. I really felt pretty torn in that situation. But that's life, and that's the nature of things in places like this. My wife Margaret and I were sitting on top of Riach at an altitude of four two four eight feet. Nobody else around, perfectly silent. And Margaret said, uh, "I just had a telephone bell ringing." Oh, I said, "Margaret, there are no telephone kiosks up here." But in the in the silence of the hills, you can you can imagine anything. The sort of living silence of the hills. There are two kinds of silence. Dead silence. If you stick your head in a cupboard, it's a dead silence. The silence of the hills is compounded from innumerable tiny sounds which blend themselves into a kind of living silence. I said, Margaret, I've often imagined things. I've imagined I've heard infants crying in this silence. I've imagined Leopold Stokowski and the symphony orchestra playing the great gate of Kiev. Margaret said, I heard a telephone ringing. She got up and went round the back of the cairn, and it was a reindeer <coughs> with a bell round its neck. The reindeer was a native Scottish animal driven to extinction in the 12th century. These are deliberate, half-tame reintroductions. When I came here, I realised there was a lot of deer, and I decided to try and tame one or two of them, which I did by leaving food out at night, so now I have two or three who will eat from my hand. Windswept is one of my deer, he is my favourite deer. And although he's extremely tame, for four weeks per year he leaves me to go rutting, seeking the females, and he ruts 
five miles from here, always in the same place, always the same, with the same group of hinds. And it's quite easy to go out and sneak down a, a burn and get to within quite close range of him and lay in the other and watch him. The rutting seasoned, then we had plenty of noise. And uh, I walked the glen one time, being foolish enough to come home to a fancy dress Halloween party. And I was terrified out of my wits when this roaring started in Correch. And well, I kept on thinking, will the next one get me? But I think they were more frightened of me than, than um, I was of them. I didn't teach him to go inside the cabin. One day the door was open and he just walked inside. Now, this is a, this is a very old stag and each year their antlers fall off. So he's not really very impressive at the moment because his antlers fell off and he's grown these in five weeks. I never dreamt that he'd do that. And when I'm here, when I'm here alone, after I've fed him inside, he'll sometimes stand in front of the fire and for 10 minutes. But one thing he's never done, he hasn't laid down in front of the fire yet. But uh, one of these days, he may do. Bananas are his favourite food. Here in one small cabin is the central paradox of the wilderness. We want to get close to it, to hug it, yet at the same time find in it a separate world something wilder and more spontaneous than that of our workaday lives. Well, the reason people come here to live from, from uh, built-up areas and particularly from places very far away from here, like England, is because of the freedom and uh, the, this being the only piece of country left as it was really about 50, 60 years ago. There's, there's uh, all other places and the style of living have altered so much that people love to get to live in a place like this. Well, the reason I've stayed here so long is this freedom to roam. In Scotland, we have freedom to roam. In unenclosed land, mountain and moorland, a person can roam at will anywhere. The gamekeepers and the deer stalkers actually welcome you. The trouble is nowadays there are too many people around. And wilderness land implies an absence of homo sapiens or as few of them as possible. The Cairngorms, myself and my contemporaries remember from 50 to 60 years ago were comparatively empty. No, uh, for some reason or another there's been an explosion I can think in the 1970s of innumerable weekends when I was away with Margaret climbing something or another and we never met anybody at all, summer or winter. Mm. Now you'd be very lucky not to meet hundreds of people. I went back to Pat. Uh, somebody said to me, oh, don't go back. You'll be very disappointed. I had to walk the 12 miles through Correch down at the far end when I got to the top end of Lunelkig there, the three homesteads are empty. Uh, nobody there. The lovely green patches, that's where the crofts, they had trees planted in them. And um, that was a big disappointment, seeing that. The people that were in this glen, have moved uh, mostly into towns and uh, also they were not replaced when they got too old to work on the estate or something like that. 
We bring such different expectations to our places. Some mourn the end of the small human communities that eked out a frugal living here. Others find the crowds of new pilgrims oppressive. More and more, I think people are becoming to appreciate that the highlands of Scotland, in terms of their scenery, of its wildlife, and the people who have made it such and lived with it, are a resource that are second to none. And I've yet to see the equivalent, the great diversity from north to south, from east to west, from mountain to loch, from moorland to seaside shore. Nowhere else can you get that right round the world. I will attempt the cable track, old, stiff and retrograde, and get some power to push me on, should resolution fade. For I must see black Mikkel pap against the starry sky and watch the dawn from Loch Nagar once more before I die. The golden plover whistled there before the fall of man, and you can hear the brittle croak of lonely ptarmigan. No heather there but boulders bare and quartz and granite grit and ribs of snow bleak, old and grey as I remember it. And if I do not make the top, then sit me on a stone, some lichen rock among the screes, and leave me there alone. Yes, leave me there alone to hear where spout and buttress are, the breeze that stirs the little loch on silent Loch Nagar. Wilderness is not about an absence of people. It's about a particular relationship between people and nature, where we step down from the throne for a while, learn to be guided by nature, set limits for ourselves. And it is, I think, the most vivid expression of what we're losing throughout the British countryside. The sense that as humans, we're partners in a larger community of living things. Over the past weeks, I've sent postcards from the fished out seas of Cornwall and bulldozed orchards of Kent. And in every case, it isn't human presence that is destructive, but our arrogant insistence on staying in control. Every new harmonious relationship we forge is a step back to sanity.